Hello. I'm Olivia Mattis. I'm so happy you've joined us here today. I'm speaking to you on behalf of the Susan Mendes Foundation, and we honor a hero, a rescuer, who is also the star of this book that we're talking about today. I am so excited to have the author of this book, Richard Horowitz, with us. And we do have the book available to you. Um, Richard has been writing about rescue for quite some time. He and I bonded over the fact that we're both Yale graduates. So we have that in common. And he has written on so many subjects as a freelance writer. But the way I first came across him was in 2019 when the New York Times reached out to the Susan Mendes Foundation to tell us the good news that there was this article on our hero, Aristides de Susan Mendes, that was about to be published on the occasion of Holocaust, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, where it was a lead article on the op-ed page. So uh, Richard and I have been friends ever since, and he did use the Susan Mendes Foundation archives to help in the writing of the Susan Mendes chapter in this book. But he's not talking about that chapter today. He's going to be speaking about three other stories that you're going to hear about, three fascinating stories everybody should know. Richard will be in dialogue with another writer, and that's Leslie Cammy that I'm delighted to be meeting for the first time. She writes first person essays for Vogue, for the New York Times and other publications. And she is connected to this history because a relative of hers was rescued by not Susan Mendes, but another diplomat, Sugihara, who also acted in that same year, 1940, towards the beginning of the war to save all those lives. And so um, Leslie and, and Richard have prepared a really terrific show for you. So right now is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Leslie Cammy. Leslie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olivia, and thank you, Susan Mendes Foundation and all those Zooming in today. I'm thrilled to be um, helping to present Richard Hurwitz's inspiring and beautiful new book. Um, at the very beginning of my career as a journalist, I had the opportunity to interview Meep Gies, who, as many of you know, um, helped sh shelter Anne Frank's family during two years in Nazi-occupied Amsterdam, and Meep told me about seeing Anne, Anne's diary lying on the floor of the secret annex where the family had been in hiding uh, and which had been ransacked following their arrest, and about how she had impulsively grabbed the diary and hidden it for the duration of the war. Um, I asked Meep why she had saved the diary which was a very obviously a very risky thing to do. And her answer surprised me. She said that she knew how important the diary was to Anne Frank and that she wanted to see Anne's face when after the war, she was able to return it to her. So I've thought about that a lot and, I, and about the role of personal responsibility in rescue and how keeping the faith with one person can have much broader consequences. And I think we'll see that at work in some of the incredible stories that Richard will be sharing with us today. Um, our first story takes place in Germany and in a very surprising milieu, the circus. And we will see a clip of the leader of a great circus dynasty um, who risked his own and his family's life in Germany to do the right thing. Um, something interesting to think about with re in relation to this story, what special things about the circus made it amenable in some ways to rescue? So let's look at this clip.
Well, thank you, um, Olivia, for having me. The Susan Mendes Foundation is a uh, an amazing organization, and um, you've been instrumental in the book uh, in so many ways. Your archive's amazing. You've had great insight. You made so many introductions. So I'm very grateful. And um, and it is true that um, a number of the, the Christian Science Monitor recently called Susan Aristides Susan Mendes the star of the book. So we won't talk about his him today, but he's um, he is sort of the um, he's the first chapter and 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 is an inspiration for a lot of it. Um, so um, I wanted to um, to talk for um, a few minutes about about three different stories um, of rescue that are a little bit less known um, than although most rescue stories are are not well known outside of people in the Holocaust world. So one of the things um, that so you saw the clip of of Adolf Altov and his and his wife um, uh, Maria, who you'll see in a moment, who who hid a family. Um, I, I ended up doing a lot of research um, into the history of the circus uh, for the book, and um, what I learned is so the circus, as you probably know, is a family business and it's a dynastic business. So when you whenever you go to the circus, they always say this family was you know this is the eighth generation of such and such acrobats from this country and. It's also extraordinarily multicultural. And um, for many years, um, up until the, the 30s, um, a significant number of the families that were involved in it were Jewish. And um, there, it was a very multicultural um, um, uh, environment. Um, one of, I think that's one of the um, reasons, alluding to Leslie's question as to, as to why this happened in the circus. Um, but a lot of them were friends with each other. They were constantly in contact with each other. There was a lot of intermarriage, including between Jewish and non-Jewish families. Um, one of the most famous families was the Lorch family. Um, and the, the girl that you saw um, who, well, tell her, uh, Arena um, Donner was a, was a part of the Lorch family. Um, they, they, were, um, they, they were world famous for um, an act, which you can see in this poster where you may have seen when one person lies on their back and they sort of kick another person up in the air. Um, it's called an Ikerin act. And they were, this was a huge um, sensation. So the Lorches were actually um, in, they traveled all over the world. They were uh, extremely famous. The circus at that time was, you know, a much bigger deal even than it is now. And they were in residence in New York, uh, at the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. They were, you can see at the bottom, the highest paid single act in the world at the time. So they also became very wealthy. And, um, uh, um, they had this home in um, in Darmstadt. Um, so let's go to the to the to the next slide. Um, so we, you've met Adolf, uh, um, who was defined. It was called really circus royalty. So the Altoffs were um, one of his ancestors. In some ways, was one of the people who created the modern circus. Yes. Um, and uh, there were actually several Altsoff families. His brother and sister also were rescuers, but um, he had his own um, circus uh, during the war um, with his wife, who's on the right. And as he talked about, she uh, was part of this elephant act that they had there. And um, if we can, go, let's flip, flip to the next slide. Um, so in 1941, uh, Arena, um, who was, a, a, so her father was not Jewish. The mother was Jewish. Um, the the at the beginning of the 30s, um, the Nazis really took the circus quite seriously, um, and they valued it much more than they did, for example, modern art. And they started to persecute the 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 Jewish um, circus. And again, there was the, there was a family called the Blumenfeld, which was probably the largest circus family. There was a a clown that my son brought to my attention uh, named Zoltan Hirsch, who was so famous. In Prague, you could send him a uh, a letter just with the name Zolt, his uh, Zoltzi, and they would arrive to him. But in the beginning of the 30s, they systematically started to drive the Jews out of the circus. Most of the Jewish-owned circuses went bankrupt. Uh, other circuses were not allowed to employ them. And then, as time went on, um, you know, there started to be significant, you know, persecution and finally deportation. And at the end of 1941. Arena knocked on the door of, of um, Adolf, as he explained, and, and asked for help. And he put her in the, uh, in the circus um, in, um, uh, in, in the act with his wife. Um, and she was a, actually a very talented acrobat and, and dancer. Um, she talked about how she wasn't actually allowed to take ballet as a child because she was Jewish. Um, and um, what, what, what happened over um, 
you know, the, 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 the following year, um, at the end of the following year, well, so, so sorry, they, um, they ended up, um, he, the Altovs, as he mentioned, ended up hiding her entire family. So in the end of 1942-43, um, her sister and her mother joined the circus as well. Um, you can actually um, see them. So Irene is the girl right in the middle of the picture. Um, next to her is actually with the, the man with his shirt off is her father. And we believe the one on the right is, the, is her mother. Um, and then the guy with his arm like this is a clown who was also 18 years old uh, named Peter Bento, who was part of the Three Bentos, which was a very famous clown act that was part of the circus with his father. And um, if you can flip to the next page. Um, so that's actually uh, Arena on the left and Peter on the right. With um, They fell in love uh, in the circus. Um, they ended up having two children. Um, this is the first child. Um, she almost died um, because no doctor would treat her um, because she was Jewish. And when the Altoffs found out about this, um, when she became pregnant for the second time, they found a doctor uh, 150 kilometers away who was a friend of theirs who agreed to treat her. And she talked about later that uh, Maria really took care of her during the, during her pregnancy. And she really felt, you know, she, she would have, she could have died actually um, if, if they hadn't done that. So the net result was um, you then effectively had a family of six people in hiding because um, her father, uh, as well, even though he wasn't Jewish, he was sent home from the front, the Russian front, to divorce his wife because she was Jewish, and instead he went into hiding. So the Altovs then, for a period of time, had had really six um, family of six that they were hiding, and it was an itinerant circus. So it went from stop to stop all over Germany, and it was a very popular circus, and the German Gestapo liked it. And at every stop as well, they would do an inspection. And um, the Altoffs got very good at sending people, um, you know, as soon as they, they would arrive there, they would send uh, um, the, the family into the trailers or they would, uh, the, the, I opened the chapter actually with a scene where they were actually hidden behind the elephants. And, and he was a, a great rock contour and he would tell the Gestapo all kinds of stories about, he'd serve them brandy and then he would tell them stories about dancing with bears in Russia. And, and he, he had this famous act with a, with a tiger um, riding a horse and, all, all the entire time, um, they were able to continue to um, hide the, not just hide the family, but hide them in plain sight because it's, you know uh, a majority of them were actually performing in the circus. Um, unfortunately, the rest of her family, which shows you the you know the peril they were in, were deported, and um, many of them, and many of the ones that were in that poster that you saw at the beginning, um, died in in Auschwitz or other other concentration camps. But um, but but it, the, the, this family was hidden. And of course, had had they been caught at any time, um, they would have been 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 deported, um, and the Altoffs would have certainly been arrested and probably shot. Um, again, denunciation was a major problem, and um, it didn't really happen very much, at least in this in this case through the circus. It happened one time, which you heard in the clip the the story. So you know, this is this was them after the war. Um, uh, Altoff, uh, the Altoffs returned. To, I mean, they continued to be in the circus. Their children ended up taking over the circus. There you see the famous act they had with the tiger. Um, the Altoff story is so when he was age 70 um, or in his 70s, he was bitten by a tiger and he continued to perform. So he was a, a lifelong um, circus uh, uh, professional and performer. Um, never really, like so many of these rescuers, never really talked about you know what he did and did stay in touch with Arena, who was quite traumatized actually by um what happened was unable for years to go into the town where you know other people had been willing to turn them in and she ultimately petitioned Yad Vashem and got them honored as righteous among the nations so um you know it's a fascinating little known story and also I found it really interesting to learn about sort of the Jewish history of the circus which was which was pretty um important um thank you Richard uh, I just want to say there are a couple of questions in the chat, but we'll come back to all questions at the end of the presentation. Um, a tiger riding a horse seems like a great metaphor for <laughs> saving Jews <laughs> in, uh, in Nazi Germany. Um, Irina Danner and her family came to Adolf, Adolf Althoff seeking help, but the subject of our next story, Irena Sendler, was a social worker 
in German occupied Poland, who um, took it upon herself to help the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto and uh, especially its most vulnerable inhabitants, its children. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting to think about in Irene's story is the function of a list she kept um, that was uh, that kept the real names, Polish aliases and addresses where she had hidden Jewish children. Um, but that list also, which was very dangerous to keep, also helped save her life when she was arrested and her underground organization um, knew that without her, this all important list would be lost. Um, one Another interesting question to think about, why did it take so long, almost 50 years, for Irena Sendler's story to reach a wider audience outside of Poland? So shall we start, Richard? Give it, uh, many people may be more familiar with Irena Sendler. Um, she was um, re responsible for saving 2,500 at least um, Jews, Jewish children um, from infants, toddlers, small children, um, teenagers. Many of the teenagers went and joined the partisans. Um, but she was really unknown um, for many, 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 many years. I found out about her at, um, when I heard a speech given at my um, daughter's school. Um, um, so th this was her around the time of the rescue. She was um, I mean, it went over on for 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 several years, but she was um, 29. Uh, um, she was 411, and um, she was a social worker. And her father was a doctor um, who had treated, um, among others, very poor Jews. And um, he died actually um, when he caught typhus um, from from some one of them that he was treating when she was seven. And she talked throughout her whole life about the impact that he had on her. And he said to her, um, she often gave the quote, quote, when you see someone drowning, uh, you have to you have to do something, you have to save them. So um, let's flip to the, the next slide. Um, so many of you are probably, this chapter was honestly, it was actually the, the most difficult for me to write because, you know, the Holocaust was terrible everywhere in Europe, but in Poland in particular, you have so many of the hellscapes that we think about, you know, the six main um, uh, 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 extermination camps. Um, this is a very famous photograph of the Warsaw Ghetto, um, which went up. Um, and during um, Lorena Sandler, as I mentioned, was a um, was a social worker, and um, from the, even from the very beginning of the war, um, she was doing everything she could. She had about three thousand clients to make sure that they, including sort of forging papers to make sure they got food and medicine. Um, but once the ghetto was formed, I mean, it, even from the beginning, the Nazis, the Jews were allowed something like 180 calories a day, which is starvation. They took um, 4% of the fit of the um, area of Warsaw, and they put about a third of the population in it. And then they added hundreds of thousands of more people from the rest of Poland. So it was, it was just a nightmare um, um, there. And um, she started uh, kind of immediately forming a network of so other social workers, um, most of whom were women, young women. Um, inside, the, there were Jewish social workers inside the ghetto and non-Jewish workers outside the ghetto. And um, she was able, it was also the Nazis were very afraid of, of disease. And she was able to get um, from a doctor and another friend for her and another friend of hers also named Arena, they called them the two Arenas, um, uh, epidemic passes that allowed her to go in and out of the of the ghetto uh, kind of almost at will. We can flip to the next slide. Um, you see her there. She wasn't a nurse, but she dressed like a nurse. But she then began taking um, children um, and, and her network um, out of the ghetto. Um, babies, um, small children, you know, many of whom at any given time, if they said the wrong thing, they could have been, um, you know, uh, captured. Um, and many were. It was many people were killed. Um, in Poland, it was particularly bad because if they caught you helping a Jew, they not only killed you and the Jew and their family, but your own family. And while this was going on, she had a mother um, with a heart condition that she was taking care of. And um, uh, but she went through, you know, they smuggled children out through the sewers. They smuggled um, children out in ambulances um, and, you know, and then they put them into hiding and um, as Leslie mentioned, she kept a list because um, she um, had the belief and the hope that um, these children would eventually be reunited with their families. 
Um, and uh, so she kept the list of, you know, the child where they were, um, and also um, their assumed name, and then their Hebrew, you know, their, their, their Jewish name. And, um, and it ended, you know, they ended up to 2000, you know, names that she, she buried it periodically, the updated list in an, in a milk jar under an apple tree at her friend. Um, one of the other people in the networks in her in her backyard. Um, that friend actually had had children, like ten year olds, that helped. And um, and so they th this went on, um, you know, for for a, a long period of time. She described, um, you know, scenes in the ghetto as being Dante esque and like horrible scenes about trying to convince people because you couldn't really get adults out, and so people had these horrendous decisions to let her take their child and bring them into hiding. And um, some people made the decision not to do that. And there were some horrific, you know, things that she talked about as well. So, I mean, one thing I just wanted to mention is Irena, um, even though she was sort of a lesser known figure, was kind of involved with almost everything that went on in the ghetto. So on the left, you have uh, Jean Korshak, who was a very famous children's, he was Jewish, very famous children's um, um, uh, writer and also ran an orphanage and uh, knew Irena well. They worked together. Um, she wrote that the day they liquidated the uh, orphanage and marched all of the children off to Treblinka was the worst day of the worst of the worst of the worst of the ghetto. Um, and Korshak is very famous because he he could have, they, he was so famous, they, they, they said he didn't have to go, but he went and accompanied the children to, um, to Treblinka um, and gave his life. Um, Jan Karski on the right is a different story, but I, I mentioned him because, you know, he was, um, a Polish um, operative who smuggled himself into the ghetto and into um, part of one of the uh, part of Belzec and then went and reported what he found to FDR and Anthony Eden and a number of other people to kind of no avail. Um, the underground knew at this point how effective Arena's network was and, and she they asked her and she was the one who actually gave Karski the tour of the ghetto um, that he got that he was then eventually delivered in, at the, in the Oval Office. Um, Let's keep going. Um, so at, so at the, the underground became aware of how effective Arena and her network were. Um, and she was at that point kind of at capacity on her ability to bring people out because she didn't have funding. Um, and so they, they, there was a group that was formed called Jigota. Um, two of the founders were um, the, the women on the left and the right. They were quite different from each other. Um, the woman on the left was a liberal Democrat whose husband had been the ambassador of Poland, from Poland to Washington. Um, the one on the right was actually an ethno-nationalist writer, very famous, um, pretty well known as an anti-Semite, but um, decided and spoke out very bravely that um, you shouldn't you know, exterminate the Jews and actually ended up forming this group that was um, dedicated to um, helping save Jews. And it was run by the man in the middle, Julian Grolny, um, who was a socialist, and um, it was funded by the Allies and by the Polish government in exile. So Arena merged her network in with them, and that accelerated um, the ability to bring more and more children out. And that's how the, the numbers got up to you know 2,500. When the um, ghetto was eventually liquidated, um, and uh, the um, the op there was no more. There were no more children to take out, but they had all of these children that were in hiding. Arena and her group um, tried to, you know, they 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 looked after them, and um, which was quite dangerous, and you know, um, brought food and supplies and 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 funds to the people that were were keeping them in hiding. Some of whom were individuals, some of whom were they were, you know, Catholic orphanages and other places. She was arrested. She was finally just caught up. The Gestapo caught her up with her. She was put in this horrendous prison you see in front of you. Um, I won't spend too much time on this part of the story, but she was um, horribly tortured. Um, she um, walked with a limp for the rest of her life. She was actually about to be, they were literally walking her to her execution when a um, SS guard pulled her aside, and it turned out that um, Zagota had paid the largest bribe they ever paid for anyone, and they they freed her. Um, she said later, you know, they freed me in part because they liked me, but in part because I had this list, as Leslie mentioned, and, you know, without, without the list um, that, that, you know, they never would have been able to match the children, of course, at this point, they knew uh, most likely that, that most of the parents were never, um, sadly, coming, coming back. Her story, um, it is um it has sort of a like many of these stories a kind of you know sad but it's sort of bittersweet ending with her but 
um, you know, she, um, after the, because she was uh, in Poland, um, it was very dangerous to be known as a rescuer. So she was actually recognized by Yad Vashem in the 60s, but really didn't tell anyone. Um, her children, she was not allowed to go to Israel to pick up the medal. Her children were not allowed to go to university. Her daughter said to her something like, what did you do? What are the sins you committed that we're all being punished? And it wasn't until um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, and that was true for a lot of rescuers in 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 Eastern Europe because it meant you were someone who had um, generally worked with the Allies and you were not a com you know a communist and um, so she had a really hard time for a long time and then her story eventually actually was discovered outside of Poland by some schoolgirls in Kansas doing a history project and then it, they made a play about it and for National History Day and it became it became international news. Um, she was nominated for the Nobel Prize um, in 2007, um, and she lived into her 90s. And at the very end of her life, was recognized um, when when she passed away. One of the children she had she had saved was was with her. Um, but she is actually probably you know one of the most amazing rescuers of all during the war. And again, um, you know, 2,500 innocent children, and at any given time. She could have been, you know, killed, and many people in her network did die, and she was almost died and was tortured. Thank you, Richard. Um, I guess if you perform heroic rescue, it's also good to live live long enough, live into your nineties, and you may be recognized. Um, our final story today begins in Lithuania, uh, where before the war, Sarah Matheson's family led a comfortable life, and it ends in Germany during the final weeks of the war and among a group of 10 uh, British POWs who chose to shelter Sarah, um, a starving 16 year old Jewish girl, then on the run from one of the forced death marches across Europe. Um, one of the things that Sarah's story in reading Richard's book highlighted for me was the relationship between rescuer and rescued. Um, how deep that relationship is for both parties. And I kept thinking, what did sheltering this fragile young girl mean to these war-hardened men? Um, Richard notes in his book that one of the rescuer, rescuers, Willie Fisher, mentioned two people on his deathbed, his mother and Sarah. So um, why don't we hear that story, Richard? Thank you. Yeah, so if we could put the slides up. Um, so um, so this is Sarah on the left um, as a child and on the right with her older sister, Hannah. Um, and she did, as Leslie mentioned, feel that she had at least until the age of 10, sort of an idyllic childhood. Um, she was from a well-to-do family. They were from Chavel, which was the third largest um, town in Lithuania. Um, if we could keep going. Um, to the next slide. Um, this is the family before the war. Um, the father, um, uh, Samuel, was actually a pretty successful businessman. Um, when they were first married, um, their parents were living outside of uh, Lithuania. They actually lived in, uh, the older sister was born in Tel Aviv. But um, uh, her mother, um, Gita's, uh, mo her mother, the grandmother was, um, insisted they all come back. So they all came back to Lithuania. Um, her father had had a horrendous experience um, when he was younger with the Russians. And I meant this is actually a, a kind of understudied issue and kind of relevant today with what's going on in Ukraine. Um, but, you know, if you had asked people, I think at the beginning of the 20th century, I mean, nobody would have contemplated what happened during the Holocaust. But I think most people would have thought that if you asked them what, what it's the most anti-Semitic country in Europe, it would have been France or probably Russia. And and the, and so he 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 had actually seen his own his almost he was almost killed by the Cossacks and his father jumped in front of the bullet and was killed saving him and that so he had been severely traumatized by the Russians. Um, so uh, this is just the town before things all hell broke loose. Um, let's keep next slide. Um, and so in June of 1940, uh, actually like right when the Germans were invading Paris. Nobody was paying attention. The Red Army came to Lithuania. They actually immediately arrested her father um, for being a capitalist. Um, he spent six months in prison. And um, the two, two weeks after he got out, um, the Germans came. And he made a decision, which 
you know, a, a number of people need. Uh, if you uh, ended up going to Russia, you were, even though they sent you to Siberia, you generally survived the war. He opted to have his family stay because he thought that the, the Germans couldn't be worse than the Russians. And of course they were. Um, he was, um, this was unknown to his wife and daughters, but he was uh, executed by um, Nazis and Lithuanians almost immediately. They were put into the ghetto, which was formed. And then they went through a series of, um, of camps, um, uh, including a death camp that they survived only because the day they arrived was the day the white the um, Red Cross was set to protect it. But then, um, sorry, let's keep going. In 1945, um, they were the the um, Sarah, her sister, and her mother were part of these um, hundreds of thousands of people put on death marches all over Europe as the Russians were coming heading um, west. The Germans were pu pulling all the concentration camp. Um, uh, uh, inmates, uh, moving them them in front um, back to Germany, try to hide what they had done. Um, these were horrific scenes of um, people starvation, um, walking in um, you know with no shoes in the snow. Um, if you fell behind, the SS would shoot you. And um, they uh, they came through um, near Danzig, um, and um, Sarah was starving and. Um, she saw someone had bread and decided to leave the line to try to get bread for her mother and her uh, and her sister. And um, she she ran off and um, was chased by a group of local people who had come out to watch the death march as a spectacle. And um, they chased her into a barn. Um, and um, at the same time, we, we can go to the next slide. At the same time, um, there were uh, 10 British POWs who were in a uh, in, in Stelag 20B, which was a uh, work camp, and many of them had been captured and been there for several years. And obviously, they were treated much better than um, than than Jewish, uh, you know, concentration camps. But they, so they were POWs, and they knew that they were weeks away from the Red Army, or, uh, you know, coming and being liberated. And there was also a group of Russian prisoners, and um, one of them wrote. Um, uh, about seeing he could they were so horrified by what they when they saw these 300 women look like skeletons marching through the through the town and then another one of them came upon um, this 16 year old girl hiding uh, in a barn but because they she had been chased and um and he and a Russian girl found her and um they both said they would go talk to their comrades and she stayed there that night which was quite dangerous and they came back to and the Russians said they wouldn't protect her, but um, all 10 of these young British POWs agreed to hide her. And so they moved her into the barn, which this this is one of them is he's standing in front of, um, and they put her in a hayloft, which was a working barn across from the police station. So they at any time they could have been discovered, she could have easily been discovered, they hit her under hay. They also nursed her back to health. Um, they, they, you know, they, um, one of them was a medic, um, they fed her, they took turns keeping her company. Um, they tried to keep her spirits up and she stayed there. And like during the, during the day when they were out, she would have to like lie motionless under straw and, and, um, um, and anyway, they, they saved her. Um, uh, they kept her there for three weeks. Um, and again, like she wrote later at any time, like they, they knew, you know, they were moments away from being um from being uh from being going home um and yet they still decided to do this um and then when the russians arrived um they were actually moved um they were moved west um they offered to, they gave her a choice they said you can either come with us or stay here and they made arrangements for her she opted to stay she went back to her um her uh her home found out that her entire family had perished um, made her way eventually to the United States um, and uh, married a judge. She became very active in the refusing movement, but she always wondered what happened to the to the to the ten POWs, and she couldn't. And she she actually had um, some material that was taken from her by a troop leader of Zionists during the six months she was still in Europe, and she said it was one of the most traumatic experiences because that was she lost track of all of these people, and then. She ended up meeting someone um, who had contacts in the London Police Department, and they tracked down this gentleman, Alan Edwards. And they met, they started a correspondence. Um, they met in 1967, and it was written up in the newspaper. And somebody uh, read it in the newspaper and said, that sounds like a story that was told to me by another friend of mine, um, who turned out to be the one that, that Leslie 
mentioned earlier, she told him, and then it turned out that, that some of them were in touch with each other and they all ended up reconnecting with her. And then in 1972, they had this famous reunion in London, um, in, in Marble Arch. Um, they were all there. The one There's nine, you can see there were 10. The 10th was the guy at the, at the barn, but apparently he showed up late for the photograph, but they were all there. They all came with their wives. And for years after they all would meet once a year to, to toast her, they viewed her as like their little sister. Um, and um, then later um, she petitioned Yad Vashem to honor them. And at that point in time, there were five of them were left alive, um, but they were honored as a group. Uh, all, well, all 10 of them were given, given the honor, um, planted a tree. And, um, and she stayed in, again in touch with them um, her whole life. She's actually still alive. Um, uh, she's the only person, um, uh, well, um, sorry, there, I have some small children that were, that were also, but, but um, of someone that age that, that was rescued, um, who's, who's still living. Um, so she's in her 90s, um, and I've been in touch with her, her daughter. She had a son and a daughter. So, it, it, you know, I, we, we started the book with, um, I started the book with Susan Mendez, who um, Olivia is the world's leading expert on how many people he actually stayed, but let's say it's in the tens of thousands, and many of the people in Reina, and Sugahara saved thousands of people, but it, the book ends with the rescue of 10 people rescuing one, you know, young girl. Um, and again, um, you know, when they interviewed them afterwards, as many of these rescuers said, they just said, like, we couldn't imagine doing, doing anything else. And, and yet there's an, there was a complete opposite with the Russian prisoners were given the same option and they opted not to do it. Um, and there's all kinds of, you know, reasons at the end of the war, everyone wanted to um, surrender to an American or Brit, not a Russian, but but um, but it was sort of, you know, and as she said, if any one of them, there were 10 of them, if any one of them had said no, she wouldn't be alive. Um, but that was a unanimous decision um, by uh, mostly, um, you know, not highly educated, um, but very heroic um, POWs. Thank you, Richard. So we will be getting to audience questions in just a few minutes. Leslie will be hand handling your questions. She has been gathering your questions from the chat box. But right now I'm taking the floor back to, first of all, urge you all to buy a copy of really this remarkable book. It's a, it's a page turner. It's also appropriate for young people. I urge you to buy one for yourself and one as a gift. So, um, our wonderful intern, Valentin Hustler, is putting the, the link in the chat box of how you can order the book. And also you will get an email after today's program with a link. We have these books available for just a limited period of time. We've ordered limited quantity. And so please get your orders in to have a signed and inscribed copy of this remarkable book. Um, after you put in your order, we will be reaching out to you to find out what inscription you would like in there and if there's a particular person you would like it sent to. So now let me tell you about our upcoming programs. So next week, we're focusing not on a hero, but on a scoundrel. And that is Kurt Waldheim. We're showing a film called The Waldheim Waltz. And it has to do with how Austria as a country has handled its heavy history to do with World War II. That's mm -hmm. where Hitler was born. There was the Anschluss. And for decades, Austria officially portrayed itself as, Aus as Hitler's first victim and all of this. Um, there's been now a total sea change in Austria. And thanks to that fact, we now have the intern I mentioned to you a moment ago, Valentin Hostler, who will actually be on the program along with the filmmaker. And he will be there to tell you about the program that sends him not only to us, but to other Holocaust uh, education organizations worldwide. It's a program called Austrian Service Abroad that sends young people all over the world in place of their military service to work in Holocaust education. It's quite remarkable. And it comes right out of the Waldheim affair. Amazing. In addition to Valentine, we have the filmmaker. Her name, name is Ruth Beckerman. She is uh, quite a remarkable filmmaker. This film that you will see won first prize at the Berlin International Film Festival. 
and she has also more recent films. Uh, so this is a film that got quite a lot of play when it came out, but uh, this is your opportunity to see it and meet the filmmaker. And moderating the program will be Shulamit Reinhardt of Brandeis University, Professor Emeritus. Um, the following week, we're having another book talk, and that book talk is uh, featuring a book by Peter Eisner called um, called the uh, the the Freedom Line. I almost forgot the name of the book, The Freedom Line, which was about a rescue that took place in France. It was the rescue of downed Allied pilots over French soil. And that's another really remarkable story. So that is in two weeks time. It's free, just like today's program. In three weeks time, we're turning to the figure of Ziegelboim, who is a name that's hard to pronounce, but it's a name that everybody should know. Shmuel Arters Ziegelboim was a very important figure. He was the only Jewish member of the Polish government in exile in London during World War II. And so we have a film about him that has never been seen in the United States. It's a Polish film with English, English subtitles. And we have Judd Newborn, Dr. Judd Newborn, who is really the world's expert on Ziegelboim to tell you all about him. So that's what we have upcoming. Right now, we're gonna show you the trailer for the film, The Valtime Waltz. Ich erinnere mich an seine Hände, sein Lächeln. Er schien sein Volk umgreifen, umschlingen zu wollen. The New York Times reported today that Kurt Waldheim, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, was attached to a German army command during World War II, which engaged in mass deportation of Greek Jews. A, he was a Nazi. B, he's a liar. And C, he was present at places where war crimes were committed. Ich war nicht Mitglied, das ist eingetragen worden von Verwandten. Es handelt sich hier um eine groß angelegte Verleumdungskampagne einer ganz kleinen, allerdings sehr einflussreichen Gruppe, auf die Medien einflussreichen Gruppe. Die äh, ehrlosen Gesellen vom jüdischen Weltkongress. Wir lassen uns daher von niemandem Hass und Zwietracht in unser Land hineintragen. Wer beherrscht die Welt? Wer? Der Deutsche ja, oder der Jude? Wer beherrscht ah. die Welt? Wer? Wer? Du gescheiter du. Reich im Nein! Reich im Nein! Reich im Nein! Das ist kein Teufel. Der Mensch ist katholisch. Sie werden nichts finden. Wir waren anständig. Okay, so you, we, you will be getting an email after today's program with information about ordering the book and signing up for these programs. So now I turn the floor over to Leslie. Leslie, the floor is yours. Uh, wonderful. Well, um, so it's such interesting programs. Um, we have a lot of questions that have come in, Richard, uh, but... Um, I know that you yourself have been uh, involved in rescue of refugees. And I wondered if you could just, before we get to questions, just tell us a little bit about that. Sure, um, I don't like love talking about that, but um, I was um, I, 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 I was tangentially involved with, uh, with um, during after the fall of Kabul, um, with a group of uh, friends who were veterans um, extricating um, an, an interpreter and his wife, a pregnant wife, and some other people um, through the wall of, of the airport. And it, it actually coincided with finishing the book. And it was it was actually profoundly, um, uh, I mean, it was one of the, it was a very, it was a very um, intense experience, but also, you know, I saw these Marines um, who were willing to, you know, risk their lives. I mean, my involvement was, I mean, I made a phone call and connected people, but I, I, um, I and, and some of them actually, you know, did, did die um, within that explosion. And I also saw these veterans who would do anything for, to save these interpreters, many of whom were being left behind um, by our government, which was just a eerie echo because it, not in any of the stories I've told here, but there are, are some stories um, 
in the book, particularly the Marion Fry, Hiram Bingham story about the U.S. and 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 Susan Mendez obviously was ex similar experience. So um, it was it was very interesting um, and intense and and obviously um, you know moving um, to be involved even tangentially in anything like that. Um, so I, I actually felt that. It, again, it coincided with finishing the book. I also was able to interview a number of the children of some of the survivors for the of some of the rescuers for the book and survivors, and I felt like that also was um, gave a lot of depth to the um, to the uh, to 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 the book um, to see them as kind of you know real real people. Um, and I don't think we do enough to honor rescuers. And and what I what I saw from the many of the veterans that were involved you know, you've probably read about the digital Dunkirk operation is there's so many people who are traumatized um, and their and rescue itself could be a traumatic and often was a traumatic uh, experience. And uh, even today, when we know so much about mental health, we don't, we don't, there's so many people who are going to suffer because of that. But, but when you go back to World War II, I think, you know, there was a, there was a lot of um, sort of an understudy current, um, to 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 rescue is the effect that it had on people and their their families and uh and part of that may be why many of them didn't want to didn't want to talk about it in addition to other reasons we could talk about like modesty or sort of danger um <clears throat> a question that's come up a couple of people have raised which is i think a question that always comes up with this topic um you know the circumstances of rescue are so varied uh, but what was a common denominator? I is there a common denominator among people? So, uh, yeah, um, I think I think there were some. Con yes, um, I mean that, that's a, it's a very important question, and it it was varied, and each rescue was different. And I also draw. I'll talk about individuals. I mean, there's a whole separate question about group rescue, and I wrote an article about that for the Wall Street Journal, and I tell some of those stories as well. The most famous being Denmark. Um, but when it came to individuals, the, so on, after the war, um, as many of you probably know, there was not a focus on rescue at all. Um, and part of that was everyone was interested in evil and why people collaborated. And then many of the victims at that time had been people who, who they survived. They'd been in concentration camps. And so they hadn't been rescued. And then you layer on top of that the fact that rescue is so rare. And 28,000 people about have been recognized by Yad Vashem out of 500 million. So 27, 28,000 sounds like a lot, but if you filled up Madison Square Garden, there'd be one. Um, and so there was this feeling by the first generation of survivors not to distort the record. And so the, the thing that, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of work done. So, you know, in, at, at Yale, they did the Milgram experiments. There's the Stanford prison experiment, but there was one study done that was compre fairly comprehensive that just, that found only one correlation, which was that um, how you were disciplined as a child had an impact. And if you were disciplined in a kind way and in a loving way and a rational way, and certainly not in a physical way, you were much more likely to be a helper than if you were physically, be, if your parent was a like sort of flew off the handle. From what I've, having gone through a lot of stories, I, I would add to that, which is, I think that the, the single biggest, there were two things that generally are found in almost every rescuer. And they're related. Um, one is that almost everyone had a parent or two parents or some major role model as a child that taught them one, you um, like Arena's father, you need to help other people, and two, that other people who may be different than you are not lesser than you, and that bigotry is wrong, and that you should stand up um, against it, um, and who who exposed the, their child to people different than themselves. Um, and that was very important. And then I think a belief in in something bigger. Um, so um, not, you know, people, well, it could have been liberal democracy. I think people in creative professions tended to be more rescuers, definitely people like diplomats who were in international, um, you know, dealt all the time with people from other other countries or other types of people tended to be more more like more rescuers. And then religion was really important of all kinds. And so but there it was people who really, whether they were a Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Muslim, it was people really internalized like the teachings of the religion and who were really people of faith as opposed to people who were into like external um, sort of, you know, um, displays of piety that is more social. And so 
you know, religion could go one of two ways because parts of the church obviously were not were not great. But but I would say it was the single biggest uh, contributor to rescue were people who who really, I mean, in Le Chambon, the town in France is a great example. And they said, you know, that people didn't read the newspaper, but they read their Bible every day. And above the temple, it said, um, um, you know, um, uh, um, love thy neighbor as thyself. And so I think, you know, like the parable of the Good Samaritan and these kinds of things really saved more Jews than anything else. Um. A couple of people have been wondering in relation to the story of Adolf Althoff, um, and I wondered also, uh, wouldn't the person whose employment was terminated want to report that Jews were being protected in the circus? Like, how did the, you know, that would have, you were fired, you might feel resentment and yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. And it's a good because because the, the details of exactly what happened are lost. And there's two different versions of that, the one he told, and then there's one in the testimony. But I, I he he did say in another interview, um, I think he said it even in the clip that he figured out an excuse. And I don't think it was like right afterwards that he let the guy go. Um, so he didn't sort of say like, I'm, I'm letting you go because of that. Um, but yeah, it's it, he was very good at keeping the Gestapo away, whatever he was able to do. Um, <clears throat> uh, some someone else asks if uh, there were Romani performers in the circus who were rescued as well. If there's any, if you know of any incidents of that, I I don't. Um, there definitely were. Um, I I don't know of any specific rescue related to them. There's one rescue um, of Romani in my a book um, which is in the chapter on Gino Bartoli because one of the people he hid was uh, was Roma. The great Italian cyclist, yes. Gino Bartoli. Yes. Another fascinating chapter in Richard's book. Um, uh, you mentioned this, but uh, someone asks in relation to the circus, what papers did Jewish people have? Didn't the Gestapo check ID papers every time the circus moved? Um, yes, they did, and they were had false papers, and that's a common denominator in in many of the uh, stories. Is that people's like lives depended on having false papers? So they performed under false papers because she had actually been performing in another circus under her um, real name and. Um, and the Gestapo found out there was actually a department of the circus, and they they told this it was an Italian circus, and they forced them to fire her. So they were not they they had um they were operating under assumed names. Mm. Um, someone asks the question why it took so long for Irena Sendler, uh, the Polish uh, social worker, to be recognized, since by saving Jews she was working. Um, against the Nazis and with the allies, which would include Russia. So why would communist Poland be reluctant to recognize? Oh, yeah, so um, several reasons. Um, and again, she was given the righteous title in the early 60s, but was not allowed to go there. Because first of all, um, there, the, there was the, pr pretty soon after the, the, the war that we had the Cold War. And um, there was, in, first of all, there was institutional anti-Semitism in Russia, in the Soviet Union, and in Poland, and, and, and as part of the communist doctrine, um, so saving Jews was not something that was looked upon favorably. It was, you know, they, um, to um, the they, the Polish government in exile, um, you know, was the, the, this was viewed as allied with like the U, the 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 Western allies, the United States and and the British, who were now considered enemies. Um, and then also in Poland, there was remained so much anti-Semitism that, you know, neighbors would be really upset at people for, and this was true in a lot of countries, um, would be really upset at people for rescuing Jews, um, they, for many reasons. Um, and so there are many stories of people who had done it, who never told anyone or even were recognized and kept their medals in the drawer. And it wasn't until after the, 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 the end of the Cold War that it started to come out. And even then, Poland still has sort of a tortured history around this, but um, what their responsibility was, but but she's definitely been been recognized. But um, 
but the uh, the communist regimes did not like did not like um, the idea of people saving Jews. So we're getting to the end of the hour, and so I'm wondering, Richard, do you have some final thoughts you would like to leave today with our audience? Well, I really um, appreciate everyone being here. Um, I'm told there's a football game later with like Rihanna singing or something. So it was very nice of you all to take take time off on 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 a on a on a Sunday. I hope you all um, do read the book. Um, it's ten different stories. Um, including, I will say, um, the great grandmother of Prince Harry, who's got a much more interesting story than, 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 than he does. So if you, <laughs> I hope my book does it well, but I would just say, I, I wrote the book really um, for a few reasons. One was out of gratitude to these people that I, fi I find their stories to be amongst the most heroic in the history of the world. Uh, I think we can all agree on that. And yet they are so undertold. Um, and, you know, there was a rabbi who once said it's a historical injustice that we all know the names of like Goering and Himmler and not people like Susan Mendez or Irena Sendler. Um, so th that, that, that was part of it. Part of it was, I hope people find it inspiring. I certainly do. I find these stories extraordinarily inspiring and it's, it's, um, it's hopefully that can help, um, help inspire people and help, um, people understand, um, it's a different way of thinking about the Holocaust. And then, the third reason um, that I, I wrote, which is we, we talked a little bit about, but I tried to get into in the beginning and the end of the book is about what we can learn about why, why people did this, not just so we historically understand, you know, they are heroics, but what can we learn today to have a society where we have more people like this and certainly a society that would never again kind of go down the path that the world went through during World War II. And I think there's, there's a lot to learn from the rescuers and there's a lot that hasn't been explored because um, this is obviously an audience that has an interest in it. And Olivia, you do such good work every week doing this, but it's still so, so unknown. And yet people really want, there's a hunger to hear the stories. And I see that one from the reaction. I mean, I mean Schindler's List obviously is a great example. I mean, it's one of the most famous movies ever made, yet we very few rescuers are known. So, so that, that was kind of the impetus behind the book. And, um, you know, I, I hope, uh, I hope anybody who gets it um, finds it interesting and I'm always happy to talk to um, and hear feedback um, from anybody who's interested in any of the stories. Fantastic. So, wow, I've been looking forward to this day for a, a long time now, <laughs> since January of 2019. And here we are with the finished book and I want everybody to order it. So please do order, order two copies, like I said before. And I wanted to thank Leslie Cammy for your wonderful questions and for being with us here today. Thank you, of course, to our wonderful author, Richard Horowitz, and to our audience that comes week after week. We couldn't do it without you. So thank you, enjoy the rest of your day, and see you next week and in the weeks to come. Bye-bye, everybody. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you.